Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Living Water Community Church um, online. And glad you guys could be with us uh, this morning, uh, wherever you're at, in your home. Um, and this week, obviously, we didn't have our band uh, come here because of the new mandate, and um, we just weren't comfortable with doing that. So we uh, put a YouTube link. I hope you saw that on our Facebook page before this, and I hope you were able to uh, gather together, gather together in your homes and uh, worship in that way. Uh, if not, you can always do it after, or you can even choose your own songs. We just we gave you three that uh, we thought were, were good songs for you to, to worship with this morning, so I hope you did that before uh, you came here. And so I want to have a couple of quick announcements. Obviously, doing a little different with TV here. I'm going to try to put my PowerPoint on this. This could not work, but we're trying it uh, either way. Uh, it's Palm Sunday. Matt just reminded me of that because... I forgot, <laughs> but it is, it's Palm Sunday, uh, next week is Easter, and we will be doing an online service on Easter as well, we're, we were messing around some couple different things, uh, like a, an outside parking lot service, but with, with just everything going on, it's just, it does not, it's not going to work, and so uh, we were going to do, we're going to do one online, uh, it's going to be very similar to other weeks, but we're going to do it, so a uh, couple quick things, uh, obviously, Giving is not here in the building, um, so we encourage you to give online. You can go to the link here, uh, livingwaterchurch.me. Uh, you can also mail it to the church, uh, 169 Rice Ridge Road here in Oakland. Uh, so either way, I just remind you, if you are a regular member, if you're just watching, and I don't expect anything from you, uh, but if you are a regular, regular attender or a member here, I would encourage you to be faithful, uh, even in this time when we're not uh, together. Um, Another thing to remind you is that we are in a month of prayer and fasting uh, this month, and uh, to really, really want to encourage you uh, to be doing this. Um, and as I've talked to some of you, I know many of you guys are fasting from different things and and doing it differently. I'm sure the way I, I'm sure the way I'm fasting is probably different than you, but I'm hoping that we are, are we all are in some way seeking the Lord in this time and truly praying for. Uh, him to glorify his name through everything that's going on around us. And I, I'm going to be putting up some uh, some prayer guides this week. I'm going to do another video uh, this week as well, just to kind of encourage you. Other leaders as well are going to put some up um, on there as well. Um, and also another quick thing to, to mention before we dive into the Word this morning and before I pray is um, our meal program that we're doing. We call it Home Cook to You. Uh, some of you might have seen it on Facebook, some of you might not have seen it yet, but um, it is, God is really doing something incredible in this. And I'm going to share a little bit in this message this morning. It's kind of funny how uh, the book of Ephesians, that the passage we're in this morning is really going to talk about unity and how uh, the body has to come together to, to do things for, for him. And so uh, the, this meal that we're putting on, we delivered this week, we delivered I think around, I think it was like 73 uh, meals to people in the Waterloo area. It was feeding like 250, over 250 people. And so uh, definitely as we're praying and fasting this month, pray and, and seek the Lord that he would, uh, the people that we are delivering food to, they would come to know him through this act. And also I would encourage you that we need help with this. Um, it is It literally doubled last week. We had 30-something people last week, 30-something families this week. We had 70-something. So it's literally doubling. We're expecting this week probably having even more people. And so we need help with this. We truly need help with this. And this is a way, as I said uh, in the beginning of this, is the question that I keep asking is how will the church respond? Like we, we, we're trying to figure out what is what is going on here, what is happening. Um, you know, we, we all want to stay healthy and safe. But the question I keep asking is how are we going to respond? And this is one way that I feel like more than anything else, we need to be doing. Uh, the church, the online service is good, and we're going to keep doing this, but what's going to be remembered when this is all over is honestly not how great our online service is, uh, because it's, it's, it's online. It's not the same as in person. Um, but I think what, and I truly believe what will be remembered is how we responded to the need that was in our community, and how we showed Christ's love in this time. So I encourage you to just help in some way. There's so many different ways to help from your home, coming here, delivering the meals. There is many different ways. And like I said, this week, I think there's going to be even more people that are going to sign up. And so uh, please, if you can help, uh, go to our Facebook page. Let us know. Um, we would love to have you. So um, anyways, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray before we dive into the book of Ephesians this morning. Uh, so let's um, go to the Lord's Prayer. 
Father, thank you uh, for you. Thank you for uh, gathering us here, um, not in this building necessarily, but uh, in our homes as we're watching this. Um, right now, and I'm sure at different times as well throughout the day, uh, more people will be um, just kind of coming together. And I pray right now, Lord, that though we're not here physically, that your spirit is uh, with us, that you would fill our uh, fill this place, fill me, God, with your Holy Spirit, and fill people's homes with the Spirit as well. Uh, that even the time the worship that maybe some people just did, or maybe they will do it in, in the, um, after this, Lord, or some point this day, that you would fill them up, God. Um, I pray that you would show us something in your word this morning. Um, open our eyes and our ears to hear what you want us to hear. Uh, encourage, convict us, Lord. Um, truly do something amazing um, in all of our hearts. And God, as, as we're praying and fasting for, for our community, uh, first and foremost, Lord, I, I pray this coronavirus, this spread will end, uh, that this will all be over um, sooner than later. I, I pray for our economy. Um, that's something that we cannot forget. I mean, there, there is, we're going to have some, some heartache from this. Be some struggles that we're going to go through after this, God. And I pray you would uh, provide for every single one of our needs now and in the future as well. I pray for our government. I pray for them to be make wise decisions. I pray for obviously the CDC as they're just kind of managing this whole thing, Lord. I just pray for, for your wisdom to uh, fill their, their minds, Lord, right now. And not human wisdom, but Lord, but you guide them in this, Lord. And I pray that uh, for the church as a whole, um, for, for us as a church, uh, but also other churches around, God, at this time, uh, that we would see amazing growth. As I shared last week, Lord, I just, you can, you can look throughout history, and whenever there's something happened like this, whenever there's something that kind of just uh, shook us a little bit, or shook the world a little bit, um, you always showed up. And many times the church would experience great growth. Many, many people would bow their knees to you. Many, many people would start asking the question, uh, who is this God? Uh, where do I find comfort? Where do, I, where do I find peace, Lord? And I pray, I pray, Lord, that right now, they, the, everyone maybe listening right now or any, everyone in our community, Lord, they would know that the place to find true peace and true healing is only found in you. And I pray that that news will spread um, throughout our community, throughout our state, throughout our world in this time, God, through the local church. So, Lord, use us in this. Um, and I pray for uh, just the people that have the virus as well. I pray you would heal them, um, Lord. I pray for anyone in our church that might be, uh, obviously, many of us are affected by this, but anyone that might be sick at this time, um, and just heal us, Lord, be with us, and guide us to the church as well. Give us wisdom and provide for all of our needs. Lord, we love you. In the journey of praying, Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right. So um, let's open up to the book of Ephesians. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 4 this morning. Um, Ephesians chapter 4. Now, uh, like I said, we're in a month of prayer and, and fasting, and um, I couldn't think, honestly, of a better book to be in right now as we are uh, doing this fast and as we are praying um, for God to just work and do something great um, in our community. And because this book, we've already, just kind of give you an overview of what we're doing, we broke this book up in three parts. Um, we had... Uh, uh, share the gospel, live the gospel, and fight for the gospel. And so three different parts. And we, we've just finished last week, chapter 3, and, and we finished a section of how we share the gospel. Uh, chapters 1 to 3, Paul gives, Paul gives some amazing outlines of the gospel. He just gives it in, it just, um, what, I, what I've shared, that this, this book, especially chapters 1 and 2, um, is where I go to many, many, many times when I'm sharing the gospel with somebody. And so what we did in that, um, that um, going through the, these chapters is just 
looking at how Paul presents the gospel and then trying to figure out ways that we can weave the gospel into conversations. And so last week we ended this with uh, chapter 3, and Paul ended this with a prayer. And this is the prayer that I just, when I came to verse 20 in chapter 3, I realized that we need to truly seek the Lord at this time. It says in chapter 3, verse 20, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us. And what I realized is that we can be praying, we can be asking God to do certain things, but God can do far more than anything we can even think or ask. And so now that I'm thinking about that, it's like this is why we need to earnestly seek the Lord. This is why we need to desperately plea for him to um, just act. For him to do something. Because the, the things that we ask for, the things that we can think of, God can do far more greater things than anything we can even think of. And so that's what I am hoping all of us are praying, praying for as we're fasting um, for the month of April is truly seeking his will. Or asking him, God, can you do something great? Can you do something far more than anything we can imagine? Would you transform our community? And as we're in this pandemic, our world is literally upended. Uh, people, I truly believe, and I've heard from other just non-Christians, um, they're seeking something. They're realizing that, that our world is literally so fragile that one virus can literally upend everything. And it's amazing. I even list, listened to the, um, I don't know how I can say the guy's last name, but the doctor, I think it's uh, Faji, I think how you say it, or whatever it is, uh, the guy that's uh, usually who's kind of over this whole thing I've been listening to him and he even him, he is saying how confused he is by this virus how he doesn't even have all the answers how he doesn't even know quite what this is or how to stop it, how to prevent it and it's just amazing to hear somebody that is top of their field and they don't truly understand what is going on and that is why we are praying and fasting that to, to go to the one that's not confused by this, the one that knows where to start, the one that knows how to end it, the, know, the one that literally could speak a word right now and the whole thing would end. And it is our Lord Jesus Christ. And so um, we're praying and fasting that people will find Jesus. And as we pray and fast for this month, we're going to be going through as a church the part of Ephesians that's focused on application. So we're moving past sharing the gospel, and now we're moving into living for the gospel. And we're going to look at practical ways that Paul lays out in Scripture of how to live out the gospel in our lives. Um, now, uh, this is perfect because as we pray, God use us, God do something in this world, we're going through a book that details out for us how God wants to use us. How God is saying, this is the way that, as a Christian, you need to live. And so I thought I couldn't think of a better place to go to right now. As we're praying and fasting, God use us. God's going to say in Scripture, this is how you got to live your life out. So, get your Bibles at home. Uh, as we normally do, our verses will not be on the screen. Um, we're, you can turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, we're going to be in verse 1 to... Uh, 16 this morning. Um, if you are, um, every Bible is open. I read the ESV. Just to remind you all, uh, this is the translation I use. And so, um, if you have an ESV Bible, open that up. You can use different translations as well. But what I read is uh, the ESV. So, um, let's start chapter 4 and verse 1. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord urge you to walk in a manner worthy of your calling to which you have been called. So, we're going to pause right here just for a moment because Paul kind of, he first gives a little detail of the situation he's in, but he also then is kind of giving us this uh, kind of introduction of what he's going to start to talk about. So first you see that Paul is a prisoner of the Lord. So, most believe, most theologians believe that Paul at this time was actually in, uh, in house arrest in Rome. Now, it's kind of fitting because most of you, or a lot of you, feel like you're under house arrest because you can't leave your house. Uh, Paul literally was. Now, you can you can leave your house. Paul couldn't leave his house. So, a little bit different the situation you're in. But he's a prisoner for the Lord. So, he is, he is in prison because he was spreading the gospel, and 
he is under house arrest most likely in Rome at this time. But notice once again, right in the start of this this verse, it says therefore. Like I, I've been I've been pulling this out every single time I'm seeing this because what you find in the book of Ephesians that the whole thing is interconnected. You, you the whole letter is not the separate little points. The whole thing is connected. And so the word therefore, basically what it's saying is because of everything I have said so far, now do this. So the idea is, is because I have said all of this stuff already, walk in a manner worthy of your calling. So because of everything I've already said in chapters 1 to 3, now you need to walk in a manner of your calling. And so the idea is, the question is though, what is our calling? Right? So Paul is saying, walk in a manner of your calling, but what is our calling as Christians? And this is why you got to have the entire book to know the context. The calling is some different, there's, there's probably, you could, you could say there's, there's different callings um, in this book, but the one main thing I believe Paul is, hint, is, is hitting at is what we find in the first chapter of Ephesians at verse 5. And we have nailed this one home, I think, already through this series, but just to point it out again. In verse 5, it says, In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. So what is our calling, or what do we call? We are called children of God. We are called his sons and daughters. But see, the, the, the idea is that we were once orphans. And many of us are still orphans. Many of us are still falling, as it says in chapter 2, the prince of the power of the air, the Satan. Many of us are still following our desires, the passions of our flesh. And what's so interesting, what's going on in this time, I've just, just been noticing this, is many of our desires and the passions of our flesh are being stripped away from us. Right? Like many of us that are so into image and looks, you can't go to the beauty store anymore. You can't go buy clothes anymore. Like, like we're just, uh, we're, we're, we're literally some of our passions and desires right now are being taken away from us. And it's very interesting watching how this whole thing is panning out. So, so God, I mean, Paul is saying in, in this passage, walk in a manner of your calling. Our calling is is to be children of God. So the idea is to live a life that shows who your father is. Follow me? So live in a manner worthy of your calling. So live live in a way that shows who your father is. That's kind of that's the idea of what Paul is saying here. And that's what I want to look at today. The thing I want to look at is basically this question is how do we act like our Father? How to act like our Father? So what we're going to find in this text this morning is we're going to find some guidelines of how to do it. Paul's going to lay out for us very simply, I think, of the way we live as, as Christians and how we show through what we do who our Father is. So what we're going to find here is three things in this passage, and what you're going to find is these three things, these three ways to act like a father, are interconnected. Basically, the idea is you can; uh, these three will build on each other, and you can't uh, honestly live like a father if you're not doing all three of these things. All right. So let's look right here and let's keep going. Chapter four, uh, verse two. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing one another in love. So we're going to stop right there once again. Now, Paul, what he does here in the first part here, he says, live in a manner worthy of your calling. And then he gives us these character traits. So you've got your calling, you know what you're supposed to do, and here are some character traits of being a child of God. And the idea is the first thing, the first way we act like our Father is we live like him. We live like him. All right? Now this is something that is, it should be so evident to us. Because this is we, we understand this because this is how we act. 
right? Um, every single child acts like their parents in some ways. I mean, it's, it's just, it's a hereditary trait. Like, it, uh, we've all heard saying before, like, uh, yeah, that's, that is definitely uh, your father's child, or you're definitely your mother's child, right? Or we say things like the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, right? It's, or it can be a good, a good uh, statement or a bad statement. But either way, there are traits that each and every single one of us have that, that, that just naturally we act like our parents. We have uh, similar likes, similar dislikes, and, and some of this stuff is just based on how we're raised, and some of this stuff is just how we're wired because of our DNA that comes from our parents. To every single one of us, in some way or another, we look and we act in some ways like our parents. We all understand this. So in a, in a way, if we are ch children of God, there should be some traits that we have that our Father has. And what Paul does here, he gives us four character traits. Four character traits that as Christians need to be found inside of us. And there's a lot more than just four. But Paul here lays out four. And I, I really think he gives us these four because they're fundamental. And they're, they're the four things that, if you look at them, they go totally countercultural to the world. They go totally countercultural to the way the world lives. And these four traits will never be perfectly betrayed, perfect, perfectly betrayed any one of us, but they were perfectly betrayed in Jesus. And they go countercultural to our desires, to our passions of our flesh. Look, look at this. For instance, uh, the first one you find, the first one labeled here in verse 2 is humility. Humility, um, and, and honestly, all of these, I was trying to give scenarios of what these might look like. They're really hard to describe in some ways. But I've noticed that is when you see it, you know it. Like when, when you see someone acting this out, you know that is a person that's humble. Right? You just you can tell immediately. But but humility is the opposite of pride, right? It's the total opposite. And we, I think we all understand what pride is, but here's something to notice. None of us really, I think I think all of us would probably say we don't like pride. But pride is something that celebrated today more than anything. Uh, it, you, many people want to make a name for themselves, even if they're trying to act like they're humble, like act like they're 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 a person of humility. If you look at the inner parts of their heart, many people they do good acts, they do good things because they want to bring glory to themselves. This is very popular. Social media has enhanced this. Uh, in a way, I know they said like the, the next generation is like the narcissist generation because all we do is take pictures of ourselves. And, and I'm not trying to harp on this and saying this is wrong, but I'm just trying to help us to notice that they, we live in a culture that celebrates pride. Things that people do that are kind and, and loving many times are just done so you can gain recognition, so you can gain some type of fame for yourself. And it kind of filters it into the next one. The next one we find, uh, the character trait, is gentleness. And here's the thing I found in this world today. Everyone has their own opinion. Like, like gentleness is hard to find today. But we all kind of want to be kind. Even, even this uh, pandemic we're in right now. Like, it's, it's uh, people are saying, love your neighbor, stay inside. And it's kind of this, I, this, this mantra we're trying to say, if you love people, then you will do this. And so we all kind of want to be gentle. We all want to be kind. We all want to be loving in a way. But then you go on uh, social media, you go other places, and people are just fighting with each other. They're battling, and, and people get angry because um, you see this in, in the political landscape that we live in today. Like, we have so much fuse with each other. We can't get along because one person does not act the same way we do, or they don't think the same way we do. Gentleness is hard to find, and gentleness is something that um, is not found truly in our world today. Many of us, honestly, are selfish, even us as Christians. You don't think it's true? I mean, I, I can, this has been more evident, I think, in this time more than, than anything. Some people are going out and, and being, we would say, gentle or, or kind. But just look at the, the shelves that are empty in the grocery stores. Now, I'm not trying, like I said, once again, I'm not trying to say this is all wrong. 
I mean, we've actually, because of our meals, uh, <laughs> we've had to empty some shelves to provide meals for people. So I don't know exactly what's, what's going on all this, but there are many people that are going to the store and all they're thinking about is I gotta care for myself. I, I, I have to screw everyone else. I don't care about anybody else. I gotta care for my family, my family comes first. And I, I get it, I get that, but, but gentleness, kindness, the idea of what gentleness is, is thinking of others first. It's putting other needs before yourself. And if you have, if you're going in and, and buying and taking everything on the shelves, you gotta understand, there are people that aren't going to have food now because you have uh, 50 things of pasta in your cupboard that's going to last you probably like two years now. So like, this is the idea. Like, We live in a selfish world. The third, thing, your third character trait you find here is patience. This is one, I mean, I don't have to explain this. We know this is countercultural to our world today. Uh, we want things now, right? I mean, so do, I mean I, I'm guilty of this as well. I, I don't want to wait for uh, videos to buffer anymore on, on the internet. Like, I, I, we can get our info now. I mean, take your smartphone out. You just say, uh, you know, uh, who, uh, what, who starred in this movie or whatever it might be. You can just literally tell your phone you can get information like, like that. Like, waiting for something, I've heard this uh, said many, many times, is waiting for something is of the past now. So to show patience, either when talking with somebody or helping somebody, blows their mind. For you to, to just be calm and just wait. And even, I think it's best portrayed as Christians when we talk to somebody, when we just sit there and listen to them. We're not trying to rush them. We're not trying to say, hey, hey, hey come on, I gotta I got go. Like, I got things to do. No, you just sit there and say, you are more important than anything else right now, and I wanna hear what you have to say. Patience is something that's so countercultural. And the last one here is really the motivating uh, trait behind all the rest. The fourth one we find is love in, in verse 2. Love. And this is a love that, um, like I said, it's, it's the driving force behind all the rest. It's a love that Christ has shown us. It's a love that's unconditional. It's a love that expects nothing in return. It's a love that's when, it's a love shown that even when people ridicule you, when people make fun of you, when people mock you, when people persecute you, in return, all you do is you show them love. And listen, that behind all these character traits, if we're not motivated by Christ's love, thing that you're going to find is, and this is the thing with all, all of those character traits, you can find people that look humble, that look gentle, that look like they have patience, but behind it all, if it's not love, you're going to find that that person is motivated by pride, by greed, by glory for self, by fame, which is once again, which is opposite. The other character traits. So all these character traits, they, they flow into each other. And all four of these character traits need to be found in us as Christians. Now, for all honest, though, none of these are found in all of us. I tell you, just this week, I've had to look in my own life and, and made sure, especially um, uh, the, um, the humility one. I mean, I, I, I can tell you, there are, there are times where I can be prideful. I can think, man, look, look, how, look, look what we're doing. Look how great we are. Look, uh, just just little things that I, I think sometimes. Like, yeah, I get prideful, and I have to check myself. No, like it's not about me. It's not about who I am or how great our church is or whatever it might be. It's about how great our God is. And that's what I want to come forth. And that's what I want to be shown more than anything in this time. But for honest, all of these traits are not found in any one of us. We all at times will fail at these traits. None of us can live it up perfectly. But that's why Paul's going to go on here, and he's going to explain the need for a body, the need for a family. All right? So you look here at verse uh, 3 to 6. It says, Eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, there is one body, and one spirit, just as, you, just as you were called to one hope that belonged to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. 
So Paul understands about himself and as, as Christians in general is that we will fail at acting like our Father. We're going to fail at this. And this is why there must be unity. I said these are all going to tie into each other. Follow, just follow this and whole entire sermon. They're all going to tie into each other. But, but Paul is laying out here, there must be unity in the body. So the second way to act like a father is to be unified. Oops. See, I feel like that's messed up on that. <laughs> it's to be unified. It's to be unified. See, uh, unity plays a role in living like Christ. In fact, I would say, and you're going to find this, that, with, that without unity, it is impossible to act or live like our Father. It's impossible. And why, you might ask, I'm going to show you in this point and ne the next point as well, it's going to become very, very evident that if we're not unified, we cannot truly live and act like our Father. So, look, it's important, important to note, um, though, it's what makes us unified. And, and, and Paul is putting such an emphasis on unity here. He even says in verse 3, he starts out, be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit. Like, be eager to, to be unified. Like, he's put this emphasis that like, we as Christians, more than anything, need to be unified. And there's a theological reason why Paul is putting so much emphasis on this. Look, look at verse 4. Paul gives a list of all these things that, that are one. And you can't get a past this idea of things being one. But it's interesting if you look at the things that are one. Right? So you look at this in verse 4. You have um, you were called to one body, one spirit. Then you have one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God, one Father who encompasses every single facet of life. That's the idea. God encompasses everything else. There's nothing outside of his control. It's hinting once again or, or stating our God is sovereign and in full control of all things. But there's something I noticed about this passage that I've honestly never noticed before. I, I have preached on this passage different times, used it many different ways. But there's one thing I never noticed before. What the things that, that Paul is stating here is basically is saying is just as God is one, we must be one. Another way to put it is just as God is unified, we must be unified. Look, look at this with me, okay? Like I said, I get that list of things. If you notice this, there's one spirit, one Lord. Now, Lord here is meaning Jesus because he is the Lord of our life. He is the king of our life. Lord is is a word that's made, it's used to mean somebody in authority over you. And Jesus has all authority in heaven and earth. So he is the Lord. So you have one spirit, one Lord, meaning Jesus, and you have one Father. Follow this? So you got spirit, and you got Jesus, and you got the Father. It's the Trinity, right? So the idea here is you have things that God is totally unified. That the, that the Spirit, the Son, and the Father are totally unified, never separate. They are complete together. Right? They, without one of the, 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 uh, the, the persons inside the Godhead, they are not complete. They would not be God. Like God is, He is the Father, Son, and the Spirit. All one, totally unified, never separate. Then you look at this also the list. So you have the idea that God is one. You look at this. Then he has the other things that are one. One body. Body meaning church. Then you have one hope. You have the thing that binds the church together. A hope that is in Christ. It's our salvation. It's the hope that uh, for, a, for a new life, for a uh, new uh, world, for to heaven. Like a hope that doesn't disappoint. A hope that's found in in Christ. And then you have one faith. Who's our faith in? It's in Christ. And this one faith is shown outwardly by a one baptism into a body, into a church. You see what I said? What Paul is saying is as God is one, as God is unified, we are unified. 
So as a church body, we must be totally unified. And together, follow me on this, together we are complete. Okay? This is going to become even more evident in the next uh, point I'm going to pull out here. And as Paul goes on. But together we are complete. Together we're going to build each other up. And least listen, God has uniquely designed the church to have everything it needs to be one. And for together for us, as we're unified, to live like Christ. The question is now, we're going to find here, Paul's going to go on, is how does God provide for each church? How do we become complete? Why is it so important that we are unified together? Why, without unity, can we not act like our Father? Why is this the case? Paul explains in verse 7, um, he's in, we're going to go all the way to verse 12 right now. Verse 7, But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, When he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. And saying he ascended, what does it mean? But that he also descended, descended into the lower regions of the earth. He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. In verse 11, now, we're going to come back to that little passage right there because it's, it's, I struggled with that for this whole entire week and I finally understand why it's here. We're, we're going to come back to it. Look, look at verse 11. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry for, for building up the body of Christ until we attain the unity of the faith and of knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood. Oh, went too far. <laughs> to the measure, I should finish that. To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So, you follow what Paul is saying in this passage is that Christ has given each and every single one of us gifts. Now we're going to come to at the end of this how these gifts are given to us. That's kind of a little uh, uh, verse 7 to 11, this little kind of uh, info or theological statement that he makes that is so uh, encouraging, encouraging to me this week and hopefully to you as well. But he's given us gifts through his grace. And we have a small list of the gifts here. Uh, these are all the leadership gifts. You find uh, apostles, you find evangelists, you find uh, shepherds and, and teachers. And the shepherds and teachers are considered your pastors. The apostles are uh, the, the 12, the, the apostles that were, wrote the New Testament. Um, but these gifts, these leadership gifts were given to certain people to equip every believer to use their gift to make the body whole, to make the body complete. So the idea is because, I mean, I am your, your lead pastor. Um, God has given me and other leaders also in this church. I, I kind of split the responsibility up and I kind of really uh, look at the people for guidance in this as well. But one of the things that I have always just been in the back of my mind is that one of my roles as your pastor is to equip you to use your gift. It's equip you to use your gift. To give you opportunities to for you to live out your gift, to, for you to do this in your life. And this is so vital to the church. I, I have... Um, something I've always just been very cautious conscious of to not do everything myself to sometimes say hey why don't why don't you do this why don't you try to do this thing and, and I, I'm gonna say this again I've said this many different times but some of you might feel your faith is lacking some of you might feel like you're you feel, feel distant from God you feel like you're not connected with him you're not close to him I, I, I'm gonna pull this point out again but it most likely is because you're not using your gift that God has given you. And this is why the third way that we act like our Father, the third thing we find in this passage is to act like our Father, we need to use the gift that He has given us. We need to use the gift that He has given us. It's one thing I've realized over the years of ministry 
um, I've realized my, my feelings, I've realized that I'm not good at everything, that I'm not equipped to do everything in the church. I'm not. In fact, uh, you don't want me to do everything in the church because I'm not really good at some things. God has not gifted me in some areas. Uh, for instance, I give you some, I, I could do a long list. I'm going to give a short one so not to embarrass myself. Um, but um, I'm, I'm not very organized. Not at all. Like I'm very, I, I, I'm type B, not type A. Some of you that know me, you know this about me. I uh, fly by the seat of my pants whenever we do anything. Not necessarily a good thing. Um, but this is why I, I have other people around me. And I look for other people in the church that are very organized, that are very uh, good at planning and doing things. Like, for instance, you do not want me controlling the finances in this church. I'm just going to say, you don't want me doing that, okay? Um, I, I can give wisdom, and I can kind of share, but if I controlled it, it would be a mess, okay? It really would be. And I don't think we would last very long, all right? But God has gifted other people that are really good at this stuff, not me. Um, also, another thing I'm not very good at, I'm not very good at little kid, with, with little kids. I'm not. I love little kids, um, but I can't teach them. I cannot teach them. Um, I have tried many, many times, and I just cannot do it. I, I do try to teach little kids. I go way over their head, and they're just like, you're confusing me. <laughs> I'm just not good at it. Um, another thing, I can't sing. Okay? That's why we didn't do worship today. Um, because if I sang... You would all shut your computer off and be like, what is this? It sounds like uh, quarantine karaoke. If you watch your Facebook, you'd be like, what is this living water? What is, what is going on right now? But I'm not, God has not given to me in that area. But here's the beauty of all this, all right? He, I, 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 I can do a long list, long list of things that I'm not gifted in. But God has gifted many of you with the areas that I am not gifted in. And the same thing with all of us in this church. There are things that we are gifted in, that God has gifted us either naturally or through His Spirit He has given us gifts. And when each and every single one of us use this gift, he, we make the body complete. Just as, going back to the last point, just as inside of the Godhead, inside of the Trinity, is complete through their unity. All that. Right? So this truth, of using our gift becomes even more evident. We move into verse uh, 13 here, chapter 4. Verse 13 says, Until we attain the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. You follow, you follow what Paul is saying here is he, at the end of this in verse 18, he tells us why it's so important. But at first, he tells us it's, some, it's kind of back to the point I made in the very beginning that if we're not using our gifts, sometimes we're going to feel lacking. So Paul, Paul, you get this idea in verse 13. He first says uh, that we are to grow up in mature manhood. The idea is that when we use our gifts, we are going to grow. First way we're going to grow is we're going to grow to mature manhood. We're going to grow into uh, adulthood. Idea is you're going to grow in knowledge of God. And you're going to be able to understand false doctrine. You're going to be able to understand when someone is speaking a lie to you or trying to lead you down a wrong path. You're going to say, no, no, no. I, I know enough about my Lord that that is not what he would say. And you're able to know a truth from a lie. Verse 15, it says it again. You're to grow up into every way into him who is the head. So the idea is back to the character traits from our first point. You're to live like him. When you start using your gift, when you start living like your father and use the gift that he's given you, you're going to grow to be more like Jesus. Because these gifts, they have to, the motivating force behind all those gifts has to be humility, has to be gentleness, patience, and love. It can't be anything else. And so when you start to live out these gifts, these uh, character traits in verse 2 become even more and more noticeable in your life. 
See, I think here's the, like, the main point I think Paul is trying to say here is that to act like a father means to be part of a body. If you want to act like your father, you need to be part of a body. I believe this is so clear if you look at verse 16. He gives this analogy here. The, the analogy he gives of, of a body. And I love that he gives us this analogy of a body because we all understand it. He, and he does this in other books as well because it's such a, a, a powerful analogy. We all understand how this works. Like, for instance, if our, our body, our physical body, if the heart stops pumping blood, the lungs won't work anymore, right? If, you're, if your mind stops working, your rest of your body will stop working. Even, even smaller parts of your body. The idea is that when you lose a part of your body, the rest of the body is going to suffer. Like, talk to somebody that's, that has lost a finger. I mean, something like a pinky. You think, okay, what, what's the big deal about a pinky? Like, if you lose a finger off your body, something small as it is, something you won't die from if you lose it, like, it is going to change the way you live. It's going to change, it's going to, the rest of your body is going to suffer because you lost that part. And the same is true in the church. This is the importance of us being unified. Like, I don't, I don't know if I, if I nailed this home yet, or Paul in this passage has really gotten the point across. I think he has. We have to be unified, which means we all must use our gifts to glorify God. Like God has brought you to this church for a reason, and that reason is to use your gift. Like, I mean, that's what it is. I mean, I, I have seen this lived out in the past couple of weeks when we're doing these meals, and, and I've always seen, whenever we, whenever we join together, we do some kind of outreach, or we do something in, in our community, or we're going, we're saying, we're going to do this. I've always seen just how God just brings these gifts in people's lives to, to life. I mean, I could give you so many examples here of just how I've noticed, like, wow, that person's really good at this. <laughs> like, wow, that person, I mean, I, I mean, could not do without them. Like that, like, that person loves to do this thing. I hate doing that. I'm so glad they love doing it. Like, I, I've noticed this so often in different people. Like, if, if this church did not come together, and this church was not unified, each one of us using our gifts, there's no way that we could have fed 72 families this week. There's no way we could have fed 200 feet, 250 people in our community. There's no possible way we could do it if it was just me or if it was just maybe a few people in this church. It had to be a joint effort, all of us coming together to act like our Father. And so I'm hoping we get this point. I'm hoping we, we, we understand how important it is to be unified how important it is that we use our gifts to show the character traits of Jesus. But here's one more thing, one amazing truth that, that I want to pull out before I end this text. One thing that, that Paul he explains here in verse 7 through 10 of how we receive this gift and the importance of using it. If you look at verse 7, through 10 again. There's this passage, like I said, this confused me for the longest time. I'm going to read it. It says, But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, When he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Which is a quote uh, from Psalms 68, verse 10. Right? But then he goes on, and he kind of gives us a little bit of a understanding of this passage of Psalms. And saying he ascended, what does it mean? That he also descended into the lower regions of the earth. He who descended is the one who also ascended far above the heavens that he might fill all things. All right, like I said, this has always kind of confused me for the longest time. But when I finally understood it, 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 I believe it ties everything together what Paul is saying. It just makes it all so much more clear. See, in verse 7 it says grace was given to us. All right, Grace was given to us, meaning this, that, that Christ descend to lower regions of the earth. Now, there's different um, views on this. I believe when he says lower regions of the earth, he means the earth. All right, not into hell. Uh, I believe he means the lower regions of the earth, meaning here. So the idea is Christ came here on earth to do what? To 
free the captives. As it says in verse 8, the quote from Psalms, he freed the captives. In, in our study in Isaiah, um, uh, in the Christmas time, very clearly Christ came to free the captives, to break the chains of sin that held us back. That's why he came. And this is the gospel clearly. Like back in chapter 2 where, where the gospel is laid out so beautifully in, in chapters 1 uh, to uh, verse 1 to 9. We are dead. We are slaves to our desires, to our passions of our flesh. We're following the prince of the power of the air. We're following Satan. And instead of God's children, instead of, instead of, instead of love that we're going to receive from our Father, we receive God's wrath like the rest of mankind. But then in verse 9 and verse 4, it starts out, But God, being rich in mercy and grace, saved us from the wrath, and instead of receiving uh, wrath, we receive love, and we are adopted into his family. Like Jesus' Jesus, Jesus' mission was clear. It was to free the captives. It was to destroy the works of the devil. To give us, as it says in um, chapter 2 in verse uh, verse 7 where it says so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus these immeasurable Im immeasurable riches are gifts that we will receive in the future in heaven but as you find here in verse 7 they're also given to us now there's also gifts that he has given us now here on earth and this is what I believe Paul is trying to get us to understand the immeasurable riches of God's grace are given to us now and how they're given to us in the form of gifts so when you show when you, when you, when you live out your gifts you show the grace that's been given to you you show that you have experienced God's grace in your life. You show that you are different from the rest of the world. You show that you have a Father in heaven that loves you, that cares for you. You show him that you show the world that you are not a child of wrath, following Satan, following your own desires. You are a child of God. You are acting like your Father when you live out your gifts. And this is so important for us to understand. This is why it is so vital as a Christian that we live out our gifts. The gift that God has given the gift that God has given you is not a burden. I know we can feel like that at times. I know we can feel like, man, what, why, why do I have to do this thing? I don't want to do this. I, I rather just uh, go do what I want to do. I rather follow uh, my own desires, my own passions. I don't. I don't want to do what you're calling me to do, God. Listen, there are many times I don't want to preach. I would say I don't want. To. I don't want to write a sermon. Sometimes I would much rather go and do what I want to do in life. There are many times that I don't want to go uh, to um, talk with people. There are many times I'm just being selfish. I'm not living out the character traits of Christ, and I want to live for myself. But here's what I found over and over and over again. And many of you know what I'm talking about. When you use your gift, and you live it to bring glory to God, when you show the grace that's given to you, you will receive so much joy and satisfaction from living out that gift. You will, you will literally experience the immeasurable riches. Like you wonder, wonder how does living, how does serving people or how does using my gift really give me riches? The riches are the joy and the peace and the comfort that will come and will fill you when you use this gift. Like I, I, oh, I always tell people that the time that I feel the closest to God is when I am preaching. Every single time. I, I just, I don't know what it is. I just feel the Spirit working through me. I can feel Him just giving me the strength to do this. This is not a natural ability of mine. I'm not a good speaker naturally. I'm not. The 
God has given me a gift to use. And when I use it, I just feel so much joy and satisfaction and peace and comfort. I can feel like he is right here with me. This is why James says in chapter 2, I've used this verse many, many times because it's such a pivotal thing to know as a Christian. Without works, your faith is dead. Without using your gift, you're going to feel dead inside. You're going to feel like a non-Christian that is dead because of their sin. Because you're living a life for yourself. You're living a life following your desires in the flesh. Without using your gift, you will feel dead inside. This is why many of us as Christians, we question if we're even saved. Where we question um, if God's even uh, real. We question whether or not like this whole thing is even uh, reality. We question everything. And the reason why I would point to is because we're not living like our Father. He has given us gifts to use and we're not using them. And because of that, we're not unified. We're not in a church body. We're, 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 we're living separate from the world. I mean, from, from what God designed, the church, and because of that, we're not living out the character traits of God. We're living total opposite of them. You see how they're all intertwined. Here, here's the, I'm going to close out just a minute here. Here's the one thing I, I want you to gain from this message. To use, is, is that when you use your gift to be unified, you will show Jesus to a world that needs him. When you use your gift, and you use it, and you use it inside of the church, and use it with other believers, and you and you your aim, your sole uh, goal, your only goal is to bring glory to God. You will show the world Jesus. You will show a world who Christ is, and so many people are searching right now. Now more than ever, church, is the time that we need to do this. And I always encourage anybody that comes to me to say, you know, how, how do I get involved here at church? I know it's hard right now because many things aren't, aren't happening. We're, we're doing our meals, and I would encourage you to join in and help in some way. Like I said, you will receive joy. You will receive satisfaction like you never experienced. But to figure out what your gift is, some of you need to experience some things. Some of you need to, to try some things. Step outside of your box. Like I, I, I did not think preaching was my gift. I did not think pastoring was what God was calling me to do. I didn't want it to be this. But man, when I finally stepped into this, and I said, all right, God, I'll do whatever you call me to do, there was... There was just so much just completeness I felt. I felt like this is it. This is what he's asked me to do. I, I knew this was it. And you will too. Once you start stepping out and trying some things, the important thing is, is we have to have in our minds, I want to live a life worthy of my calling. I want to live like my father. I don't want to live for my selfish desires anymore. So, church, let's together, even though we, it's a hard to join together right now, it's hard to be in one place right now, but there are still ways that as a church, together, we can show our community, our community the love that God has for them. So as we pray and fast, let's continue to pray that God will give us opportunities, that the Spirit will convict people in our, in our community. That he will create a longing in people's souls, especially those that we are giving meals to right now. And so, well, and so my, my prayer has been ever since we started this that God, with this act of love, lead them to understand your love. With this act of love, lead them to repentance. With, with that, uh, this act of love, lead them to making you their Lord and Savior. Church, I, I pray that that a big thing that we can always do after you hear a sermon is you just neglect it. You're just like, okay, whatever. I'll move on. Same thing with praying and fasting. I know we can all just neglect this and say, well, someone else will do it. Don't do that. God is doing something. I don't know what he's doing right now. I don't know what's happening, but he is in the midst and he's working. Church, 
church, now is the time to go out and show love in some way. And I say, be safe about this. And and, and I don't, I'm not calling us to, to rebel against the government. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that we need to still show love even in this time. So uh, I'm going to pray for us. And then um, afterwards, uh, you can check your computer or your device and go on our day. Father, uh, thank you for you. Thank you that we can use this technology, Lord, to still get your, your message out. I pray that it, do, it does uh, cause in us a stirring in our soul to uh, use the gift that you have given us, God, for us to be unified, for us to uh, live like you. Lord, I think now more than ever we need to live like you, God, and I pray you, you, would, you would challenge us to do this, Lord. And I pray for anyone that, that might be listening, now or whenever it is, God, I pray that, that you will convict them of their sin. You would draw them to yourself right now, God. You would show them you are King of kings and you are Lord of lords and there's no other God but you. God, would you just uh, change people's lives right now and anyone that's listening that has never done that, I pray that today is the day of their salvation. Right now, in your home, just pray a prayer. Ask God to be the Lord of your life. Ask Him to change you. Ask Him to forgive you of your sin. It doesn't have to be anything special. It doesn't have to be all the right words. God knows your heart. It's a heart issue. To cry out to Him right now. God will change you and He will give you the immeasurable riches of His grace because He loves you more than any other person, more than any other thing in this world. He loves you with a love that is so unfathomable that is nothing like we've ever seen or nor can we understand God do an amazing work through this time Lord I even pray you bring revival in this time God do something beyond our imagination more than we can ask or even think thank you for using us we love you in Jesus name I pray amen alright well thanks for joining us uh, you can, if you have any needs or anything at all, you can let us know in your comments uh, below or message us directly. Or if you want to get involved with anything we got uh, going on uh, with the meals or whatever else you want to know is that we're doing, please message us. Uh, we'd love to contact, uh, get, in co get in contact with you. Um, remind you once again, we'll put the uh, link to give um, below somewhere. We'll figure it out. But we'll remind you to make sure you're faithful in that. Uh, Miss you all, and I guess I'll see you next week.